Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, good night for uh, most of us, or good evening for most of us uh, that are connecting to us from different uh, regions of the world, and especially from Turkey. Now, in the DLP lecture series, we are now hosting a very good friend, uh, Professor Joydi Mitra. We are honored to host him uh, tonight as the IWPS Turkey section with a topic entitled Energy Assurance with Renewable Generation. But we, before we leave the floor to Joydeep, uh, I want to have a very quick uh, biography for him so that you will be better knowing him, uh, even though I know most of you know him very well. And Joydi Mitra, uh, who, is, uh, who has a PhD degree and a, he, who is a fellow of IEEE, is a professor of electrical engineering at Michigan State University, is Lansing, director of the Energy Reliability and Security Laboratory and senior faculty associate at the Institute for Public Utilities. He received a PhD in electrical engineering from Texas AM University College Station and a B.Tech Honors in Electrical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur. For Professor Mitra is known for his contributions to power system reliability analysis and reliability based planning. He has over 200 publications and patents in the power system area. And he is the co author of the book Electric Power Grid Reliability Evolution Models and Methods and of IT standard 762, a standard on reliability reporting. He is the recipient of the 2019 IT PS Roy Billington Power System Reliability Award and the 2020 PMAPS Merit Award. <laughs> Professor Mitra serves as an associate editor for the IEEE Transactions and Power Systems and Power Engineering Letters and for the IEEE Transactions on Industry Applications. In the past, he has served as chair of the IEEE PS Analytic Methods for Power Systems Committee, chair of several IEEE PS subcommittees, and as an editor for the IEEE Transactions on Smart Grid. Professor Mitra is a fellow of IEEE and an IEEE PS Distinguished Lecturer. And as a distinguished lecturer, we are honored to have Professor Joydeep Mitra and as a very good friend, Joydeep, tonight with us. And Joydeep, if you're ready, we will leave the floor to you. We'll, and okay. we'll be listening. Yes, Thank you, Usman, for the start. kind introduction. Now, I have already said, uh, you know, check the screen sharing here. Are you able to see the screen or? Now I'm going to maximize the screen, okay? And if you, uh, I'm going to go into slideshow mode. So if there's a problem, let me know because I won't be able to come back to that other screen. Am I in slideshow mode now? Ozan, please let me know. Uh, yes, now uh, I was at the backstage, and yes, uh, we can see it in full screen, and that looks great. Uh, we are listening and we are leaving the floor to you, but in any case, we will come back on the floor to help you. Excellent. So, hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Joydeep Mitra, as Ozan has very kindly introduced. And I'm going to be speaking about uh, energy assurance with renewable generation. Here's a quick outline of my presentation. I'm going to very briefly introduce uh, myself and my work. It's going to be very brief because Ozan has already given a fairly long introduction. Then I'm going to start with a renewable energy outlook. and I'll talk about variable generation and associated challenges. Particularly, I'll talk about ramp rates and ranges, variability and how you mitigate variability, the impact on system stability of renewable generation and so on. I'm going to try and give you a conceptual understanding without going very deep into the mathematics. And then I'm going to speak a little more on the impact of 
sizing of storage, impact and sizing of storage. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, storage in recent times, and I'd like to mention some of this. Again, I will not go into details. I'll give you a flavor of some of the things we've done. And we'll tell you a little more about the things that we've um, in our lab, the, the things that we've done on renewable integration, and then I'll wrap up the presentation and open up the floor for questions. So as an introduction, I'm director of the ERISE laboratory. Okay, so on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, right on the top corner, you see the logo of my lab, and on the left-hand top corner, you see the logo of Michigan State University, <laughs> okay? And I'm not going to read out everything else on the screen because Ozan has already mentioned all of this. So I'll move on. Before I begin discussing uh, the topics that I uh, outlined today, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of those students of mine who have contributed to the topics that I'll be discussing today. Now, uh, I worked with many other students, of course, as part of my research, but these are the students who have contributed to the research that I'm going to be discussing here today. Um, you can see that five of them are in uh, are professors in different universities all over the world, and uh, some of them are in national labs. And I have one continuing student now, uh, Otri Beda, who's going to be graduating in August and joining Sandia National Labs. Talking about the renewable energy outlook, I wanted to start out with giving you a picture of the installed capacity in terms of uh, uh, you know a megawatt capacity installed and as you can see tw more than 27 percent more than a quarter of the installed capacity in the world today is renewable energy and out of this the large chunk is hydroelectricity okay so most of this, almost two thirds um, of the renewable energy production is hydroelectricity. Of the rest, there's a lot of wind. The, after hydro, the dominant renewable resource is wind. And then there's solar. Now solar has been growing very rapidly. And then, about two and a half percent is biopower and geothermal CSP. Now CSP is also a kind of solar. CSP stands for concentrated solar power and ocean power. Now these numbers uh, correspond to the end of uh, the year 2019. Okay, and this was uh, reported on last year's global status report. This chart shows how renewables have been growing over the last six years. And you'll notice how wind used to dominate until about uh, five years ago, and uh, about four or five years ago, and then about four years ago, well, about five years ago, uh, you'll see that solar has overtaken wind, okay? and now you can see that uh, the solar capacity installed uh, in the last couple of years is a lot larger than that of wind. Okay, so this shows how the variable, uh, the, the various renewable energy resources have been growing in terms of installed capacity. I want to talk a little bit about some of the social and political factors that have affected the energy outlook. In recent times, two phenomena that have uh, been influenced with uh, by you know politics and health concerns have had a lot of impact on 
the deployment of renewable energy worldwide. One is the increasing pressure to reduce coal generation, not only because of greenhouse emissions, but also because of health effects, right? The pollutants, uh, including mercury, um, do have a very adverse effect on uh, the health of people, especially those living in the vicinity of coal plants. And even though it would be nice to have clean coal, it is uh, very expensive and uh, we are not at a point yet where we can produce very clean coal generation. So there's been a lot of pressure to reduce coal generation. The other thing that we've seen in recent years is the fear of nuclear generation. Even though nuclear is uh, a very clean um, resource, you know, there have been a few incidents in recent years, most recently the Fukushima event that have scared people. So now um, most of the reason for resisting nuclear is emotional, okay? But it is, it is true that um, we are not developing nuclear resources as quickly as we should, especially if uh, we have to do away with coal generation. Okay. Another factor, and uh, this is particularly so in the United States, but some other countries have also experienced this, that the design and operation of electricity markets, which really focus on economic and financial instruments rather than uh, engineering and uh, putting engineering and technology at the forefront and trying to plan their operations from an engineering standpoint, these electricity markets have undermined the operational efficiency. And I'll give you an example of that a few slides later when I'm telling you a story about um, wind and storage and how they operate in a market in the United States. Finally, I want to mention that a few years ago when shale gas was discovered in America, it enabled America to uh, become energy independent from the oil and natural gas perspective. And this has really de uh, you know, redistributed the global petroleum e economy that used to persist before this happened. Just a second. Now with so much renewable energy, I think it's a good idea to give you an introduction to some of the operational challenges that we encounter when we try to uh, integrate renewable energy. Most of you are aware of this problem of resource variability or intermittency. That is, renewable energy is not available upon demand. It's not available when we want it, but it is available at the whims of nature, right? So this contributes to increased uncertainty, particularly when we combine the uncertainty of availability of resources like wind with the uncertainty of load itself. And I'm going to explain that a little more in a couple of minutes. Then there is the increased need for ramp rate. What is ramping? Ramping is how quickly a generator can increase, a conventional generator can increase or decrease its output. And I'll explain very soon why there is an increased need for ramp rate and an overall ramp range. What is ramp range? It is the range in megawatts over which generators, conventional generators, have to increase or decrease their outputs. I have a graphic a few slides later that will explain this fairly well. There is also a reduction of regulation capability and an increased need for frequency regulation. Conventional generators, as you know, used to contribute to, and still do contribute predominantly to holding the frequency constant across the AC grid. 
I'll explain very soon how this has been a challenge with increased penetration of renewable resources. Finally, there's also a decrease of base load and an impact on base load generators. What is base load? Base load is that load that remains on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the base load generators are the generators that were designed to serve this load. Again, I'll explain this using a graphic. So first, let's talk a little bit about the variability of wind and solar. They are both considered variable or non-dispatchable, as I said, because they are available not upon demand, but upon natural and uncontrollable forces. Now, wind and solar are a little different in their characteristics. Wind is not very well correlated with load. How often have you seen that on a hot summer afternoon when you'd really like to see some wind not just cooling down the air, you know, with airflow, but also running your windmills and producing some wind power. But that's when the wind decides not to blow, right, on the hot summer afternoon. But then later in the day, in the evening, when it's cooled down and you don't need it as much, that's when it decides to blow. Okay, so wind is not very well correlated with load. Okay, and its variability and unpredictability cause several operational challenges. It also has low capacity credit or low capacity value. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with this term capacity value, so I'm going to explain this. Here are two different ways of looking at the concept of capacity value, okay? I'm not going to read this out for you, but while you're reading it, I'm going to give you an example so you can make the connection. Now, take a 100 megawatt wind farm, okay? And you know that it provides a certain level of reliability to the grid. Now, if you had to replace the 100 megawatt wind farm with a dispatchable resource like a combined cycle generator, dispatchable meaning that you can get power from it, as much power from it, up to the capacity of the resource, of course, as much power from it as you need. So if you had to replace a 100 megawatt wind farm with a dispatchable resource, that would serve the grid with the same level of reliability as the 100 megawatt wind farm. What is the size of that dispatchable resource? And that is typically in the order of about 20%, okay, or 20 megawatts to replace the 100 megawatt wind farm. The other way of looking at it is that if you had to replace a 20 megawatt wind farm with a, uh, if you had to replace a 20 megawatt steam turbine with something that, with a wind farm that meets the demand with the same level of reliability, it would be approximately 100 megawatt nameplate capacity, okay? If this is the relationship, then the 20% is the capacity value of the wind farm. You get the idea? Now, I'm using a round figure of 20%, but depending on whether it's onshore or offshore or where it is located, what the correlation with the load is, the capacity value of wind varies. Okay, from location to location and, you know, depending on the correlation of the wind speeds with the load and so on. There are many factors, but it is roughly in the order of about 18, 20 percent. For offshore wind farms, it's a little higher. With that, let's uh, talk about solar energy, which has a different char characteristic. It shows better correlation with load, right? because 
solar is available during the daytime when the loads are also higher. But on the other hand, solar is never available in the night. That's obvious, but it's something to be aware of when you're planning for solar energy, okay? It has lower variability and higher predictability than wind. And in many places, they have combined thermal storage with solar thermal and given it a little higher capacity value and reliability. So I was talking about variability and here is a chart that will help explain variability. The blue curve that you see here is the output of a 150 megawatt wind farm located in California. You can see how during the daytime hours, the wind output has dropped. The red curve here is the output of a 24 megawatt solar PV photovoltaic farm located very close to the same wind farm. Notice that there are different scales because the two farms are of different sizes, okay? So the left-hand size, left-hand vertical axis shows the uh, wind generation and the right-hand vertical axis shows the solar generation in megawatt. So there's a couple of things to notice here. One is, that in some locations, now this is not necessarily true in all locations, solar can to some extent complement wind, okay? So you might ask, so if we build wind and solar in, uh, you know, in a location, uh, in the same location or very close by, can we uh, use them to smooth each other out and provide a steady total output? Theoretically, it's possible in some locations to do that, but you would have to build them on the same scale to be able to help them smooth each other out, okay? Now, this data has been taken from this report uh, that I've listed at the bottom of the screen, okay? Now, I'll explain the other thing that I was talking about, that is ramping requirement. What is ramp rate and what is ramp range? Here is an example from a report uh, by the National Renewable Energy Lab. Okay, this report is called The Role of Energy Storage with Renewable Electricity. Again, you know, if you Google this uh, title of the report, you'll be able to uh, download this report. It's available for free. This data is uh, for a, a load and uh, the wind farm that that are uh, that is serving that load okay uh, are connected very close to that load so i'll i'll explain this and try to help you understand what is ramping requirement and uh, what is ramp range okay the blue curve that you see here is the load okay you can see that it's got a peak of about uh, a little over 4500 you know about 4700 megawatts sorry, 47,000 megawatts or 47 gigawatts. And the red curve that you see at the bottom is the wind power output. Again, if you compare the blue curve and the red curve, you'll see that uh, wind is almost negatively correlated with the load, right? When the load is high, the wind is low and so on, most of the time. The green curve is obtained by subtracting the wind from the load, okay? This is called the net load. This means that this is the load that the conventional generators will have to supply because the difference between the blue and the green curve is the amount that has been supplied by the wind. You see why the green curve is lower than the blue curve? Because the difference is the amount that has been supplied by the wind now. But if you look at how much the green curve is varying, 
you'll see that the variability and the uncertainty is increased in the green curve with respect to the blue curve. This shows how the wind has contributed to an increase in the uncertainty. Okay, uncertainty of what? Of the net load, that is the amount of power that the conventional generators will have to supply. Okay, you'll see uh, two other things from this green curve that the range, you know, that is the difference between the peak and the trough has also increased compared to the blue curve, which means now the conventional generators will have to ramp up and down a lot more. So that is the ramp range. And if the ramp range increases for the same period of time, the ramp rate will also have to increase, right? Notice that, uh, realize that not all generators are able to ramp up this quickly, okay? Some generators are, and so now generators with ramping capability are in high demand, okay? But this gives you an idea of ramping requirements. In recent years, there's been a lot of um, gas turbine type generators that have high ramping capability that have been installed to take care of this ramping requirement, okay? Now we've talked about variability. Let's look at some of the options for variability mitigation. One option is to take advantage of temporal diversity. That is, you know, as uh, the uh, resource varies with time, using storage. In other words, store the energy when you have an excess of energy, okay? Charge the storage if it's a battery or, okay? And discharge it when there's a shortfall in renewable generation. Okay, so storage, as we know, can help smooth out the variability. Another approach is that of aggregation, taking adv advantage of the geospatial diversity. What does this mean? If you are in Ankara, for instance, and the wind is not blowing in Ankara, it could be blowing in Istanbul. And if you have a strong transmission line to bring that power from Istanbul to Ankara when you need it, that helps smooth out some of the variability, right? So that is the notion of aggregation. The third means of variability mitigation is generation following. It's a little harder to explain, but I have a slide that will explain it. In the meantime, let's talk a little more about the technology and the cost of these means of variability mitigation. Storage, as we all know, is very expensive, okay? Aggregation is also expensive because it requires significant transmission upgrades. Transmission lines can be pretty expensive. I don't know how much it is in Turkey, but, in the United States, it's almost a million dollars per mile on the average, okay? High voltage lines are close to $2 million a mile. And for flexible loads, we need smart grid technologies, which are also fairly expensive. So all solutions are pretty expensive, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about storage. The most common high capacity grid scale storage today is pumped hydro, okay? However, there is not much pumped hydro being built anymore, okay? And to make matters worse, some existing installations are being decommissioned. Also, pumped hydro is not always convenient for use with variable resources. And I'll tell you a story relating to this, okay? Now, in recent years, there has been a lot of investment in grid scale storage technologies. Okay. Um, a lot of utilities have been building battery storage, mostly lithium ion. Another storage technology that has come up in recent years is vanadium redox flow batteries. Other, another kind of flow batteries that used to uh, be common in the past is sodium sulfur batteries. You may have heard of them, but 
those are now being decommissioned because of environmental hazards. Um, vanadium redox is a promising technology that is coming up now. Here is a comparison of different energy storage systems and their capabilities, as well as their maturity, okay? The costs are also given here, as well as the total discharging period that you can take advantage, uh, during which you can take advantage of this uh, storage technology. So if you look at the last column, it gives you a sense of how long the storage will last after it's been charged, okay? Supplying power at grid scale. And you'll see that pumped hydro is still the largest and the most viable in terms of grid scale storage. Talking about transmission expansion, here is a chart that, uh, here is a map that shows um, existing lines and new lines of transmission that you would need if you had to realize 20% win by 2030. Okay, so this was a study performed by the Department of Energy. And they realized that if we had to take advantage of this aggregation capability that I was telling you about using transmission alone, then we would need 12,650 miles approximately of total transmission lines, which would cost about $20 billion. So you can see that transmission is also an expensive alternative. Now here's the notion of generation following, and I'm going to take a minute to explain this to you. What you see on the left is the traditional concept of system operation. What this is, is what we know as load following, right? The concept of load following says that customers will turn their loads on and off whenever they want to, and generating companies will dispatch their generation to track these loads. And so if you look at this, the uh, total peak of these, uh, the, on each graph here, the one on the left and one on the right, we are representing one week of loads, okay? But the different colors show the resource mixes, okay? Now the notion of generation following, which is, it's not been realized yet. Um, this was a speculation about a typical week in May, 2020, but it was, you know, an example, a simulation performed. What this says is, Notice how much more solar there is. All the yellow here on the right-hand side is solar, okay? The idea is this. Since we cannot control wind and solar, what we are going to do is control the loads. So the notion of generation following is the exact opposite of the present-day concept of load following. So what generation following says is that we are not going to control the generation, but we are going to control the loads to track the generation that is available from renewable energy. Now, I mentioned three different means of variability mitigation. You know, in different places, in different countries, depending on what is available, Many of these uh, means will be used to different extents. So we'll see a combination of these three different, uh, different means of variability mitigation, okay? There are many other issues with uh, variable generation, integration of variable generation. Um, I won't explain all of these. Many of these are uh, well known to most of you. I'll give you an example uh, of how it affects land use and quality of life. As you know, wind and solar resources take up large amounts of land. And very often these have to be uh, rented from the landowners. 
So there is a cost involved with this. Okay. And on top of that, sometimes the people living in these areas with uh, large windmills have complained of things like shadow flicker and low frequency rumble coming from the windmills. And they've said that it causes depression and things like that. So it affects the quality of life. Okay. Collection uh, of power from so many um, little generators. Well, they're not necessarily little, but they're spread out over a large area. That is also an issue. And I'll talk a little more about that. Okay. And you know that uh, wind and solar do not produce reactive power. There are power quality issues, low voltage write through issues, and so on. There are also stability and reliability concerns. I'm going to talk about stability on a later slide. And um, as far as reliability of individual wind turbines is concerned, um, there are some studies that, is, uh, that have reported that uh, you know, they're not very reliable. You might have driven past a wind farm and seen that you know, some of them are turning, but many of them are not even when the wind is blowing, right? So they need a lot of maintenance and usually end up with a lot of downtime. I'm going to take a minute to explain the stability and frequency regulation issue. As you know, stable operation of the grid relies on the rotational inertia. And I've given a graphic here, the top graphic, to explain this. What happens in a conventional generator is that there's this heavy turbine rot rotor mass that rotates uh, at a fixed frequency of omega. Uh, in Turkey, I think it's 50 hertz, right? So there's a stored energy in this. That is half J omega squared, where J is the moment of inertia. Okay, And as long as there's a balance between the mechanical power and the electrical power, the speed remains constant. But every time there's an imbalance, let's say a load is switched on and the electrical power goes up, it takes a few seconds to minutes for the mechanical power to bring it back up there, okay? And in the meantime, what happens? The That additional energy comes out of the turbine generator system, thereby slowing down the generator a little bit, right? Or lowering the frequency a little bit. But we don't notice these changes in frequency because there's so much inertia all over the grid from the conventional generators. But variable resources contribute very little to inertia. Okay, you can imagine solar has no inertia at all, and wind, you know, after filtering it out through the um, uh, uh, through the inverter through which it is connected to the grid, doesn't provide any inertia either. So now, what's going to happen is with more and more wind and solar, the relative amount of inertia drops and so the frequency regulation capability also drops okay people have been thinking of using storage to provide synthetic inertia to make up for this and the lower graphic here uh, gives you a conceptual sense of how that works okay i've reported some studies here from frequency regulation the blue curve shows a case with no gas turbine. Okay, by the way, these curves um, show what, how the system responds to a step change in load. Okay, the load has a, a large load has been switched on. Okay, now if we replace 20% of the system inertia, or if we remove 20% of the uh, system inertia by replacing the conventional generators with uh, renewable generators, then the response is shown with the green curve that you see here, okay? Notice that the settling time is a little higher, the frequency excursion is also a little higher. I was talking about gas turbines to help with the ramping, right? But gas turbines can actually exacerbate the situation, okay? And I have summarized this here. So with inertia reduction, the frequency excursion is, lar is larger and recovery time is longer. But gas turbines, which are being uh, increasingly deployed to help with ramping, actually 
can exacerbate the frequency excursion. If you want to look at uh, the detailed studies, it, it's available in this paper that I've cited. I'm going to briefly tell you the story about storage and wind. What you see on this map is the Ludington pump storage plant in Michigan. So the here you see a high reservoir, okay? And on the left, so if you extend this border onto the left, on the left is Lake Michigan, which is lower than this reservoir. This reservoir is on a hill, okay? So what they do is during off-peak hours, they pump water up the hill into this reservoir. And uh, during peak hours or when they want to take power out of the storage, they run the water down through the same turbines, okay, to produce power. So that's how pump storage works, right? Now, right behind this pump storage is what uh, they call the Lake Winds Energy Park. And that is a 100 megawatt wind farm with, you can see all these green spots. These are turbines, okay? This is a picture that I took from this point of view, okay? I stood here and took this picture looking at the wind farms across the reservoir. So you see, this looks like an ideal mix of renewable and storage, right? But does it help? Does it work? Let's look at the Ludington facility. It's jointly owned by two utilities, okay? It's a large 842 acre reservoir that can store 27 billion gallons of water. Okay, it's got six pen stocks, each with a 433,000 uh, horsepower turbine coupled to a 362 megawatt generator. So there are six of these generators with a total capacity of more than two gigawatts. Okay, but wind and storage are not matched because you need about 350 megawatts to turn each turbine as a pump. Whereas the whole wind farm has a total capacity of 100 megawatts, okay? So this doesn't work. But careful sizing can work. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. But I, I want to tell you a little more about this Lake Winds Energy Park, okay? And some of the integration challenges that I was talking about. Now, if pumped hydro is not cy cycling with the wind, what is cycling? Actually, what is cycling are the utilities coal plants. Because of the way the market is operated, the coal plants end up cycling, and this contributes to more coal consumption per megawatt produced, per megawatt hour produced, to higher pollution, again, per megawatt hour produced, and reduce plant lifetime compared to steady state operation. You know that coal plants are not designed to cycle. Remember what I was telling you, that market operation sometimes is not in the best interest of good technical principles, okay? They can sometimes be in conflict with technical principles. And this is an example. Another thing is, that the location was not the most favorable in the region from the standpoint of wind speed and availability, but it was chosen because it overlaps with Consumers Energy's 115 kilowatt, uh, kilovolt network in the region, okay? So collection was easier. And because of that, they had to move it to a suboptimal location. Now they spent $232 million on the wind farm and you would think after that, the energy is free, right? Not so. They initially paid $10,000 to each landowner whose land they were leasing. And the total rents are about $422,000 every year. Also, the annual expenditure on turbine maintenance is half a million dollars a year. So wind farm is not free, right? Wind energy is not free. I talked about sizing of storage for reliability. And the reason is, if you work, or if you can properly design a storage facility 
to match its size with the wind farm, then you can almost make it dispatchable. Okay. So the problem is, can we determine the amount of storage in both power capacity and energy capacity that will meet a specified level of reliability? And if that specified level of reliability is about the same as what we get from conventional generators, then we are able to mitigate variability. So you can see that this has to do with, it's a quantification problem, okay? And we've done a lot of work in that area. Okay, and I'm going to summarize that with a graphic. So if we have a wind farm, on, you see this on the left, and we add some storage, then we get a more reliable combination of wind and storage that is almost dispatchable in that you can pretty much get power from it whenever you want to, okay? But in order to design the storage, we need two attributes, right? The power capacity of the storage and the energy capacity of the storage. Once you calculate the power capacity, if you know how long that storage will be required, the duration, then the product of the power capacity and the duration, the power capacity on the left, the duration on the right, okay, the product will give you the energy capacity, right? So in our research, and it's, it's a fairly involved body of work, we have shown how the power capacity is basically equal to the difference between the nameplate capacity of the wind farm and the capacity value of the wind farm. So if it's a 100 megawatt farm with a 25% capacity value, then your storage will have to be a 75 megawatt storage facility, okay? And how do you calculate the duration? That is from using this formula. Again, I'm not going to go into details, but it's based on the mean downtime of the rest of the system, okay? Related to the reliability of the rest of the system. And a thing called an unavailability reduction ratio, which has to do with how much we are reducing the, re the reliability of the system, um, the unavailability of the system, or how much we are increasing the reliability of the system using the battery, okay? So I wanted to give you a top level overview of this approach, but if you want to look at the details, there are three papers here where we have systematically developed this body of work. And uh, by the way, all of these papers are available on my website. I'm very easy to find on Google, just Google Joydeep Mitra MSU, and it'll take you to my website and there's a site from where all my journal papers and some conference papers can be downloaded, okay? The preprints. So we've done uh, some other work on renewable integration and I want to give you a, a very quick overview, okay? So we talked um, on the last two or three slides the, about the importance of sizing um, storage for reliability. We also talked about the frequency regulation aspect and how uh, storage devices can be used to help with frequency regulation. And we've done some work on the sizing of storage for frequency regulation. Um, we've also developed an operational constraint that you can use in things like reliability studies or you know market uh, operation planning or even in a regulated regime, okay, your um, unit commitment and dispatch processes can use this operational constraint. If you want to um, work with optimal power flow in any of these frameworks, we've developed a method of frequency, uh, you know, including the frequency security constraint in the optimal power flow framework. So, um, this is a summary of some of these things that we've uh, done in determining the size and constructing constraints that help plan for um, better stability and better reliability in the presence of renewable energy.
Okay. Moving on, we've also done some work on uh, the construction of models for wind farms. Um, the first paper listed here describes a wind farm model that takes into account wind variability, turbine failures, turbine correlations, and so on. And then we've uh, tried to refine this model by including the correlation between wind speed and turbine availability and so on. So we've done a fair amount of work here, and I wanted to give you an overview. So now I'm ready to conclude my talk. Um, I want to make a few comments in conclusion. So one of them is that renewable energy resources um, are a tremendous potential that uh, for, you know, gives us promise of sustainable energy, uh, which is environmentally friendly and so on. But they also present complex challenges to energy assurance, as I just outlined to you. Um, one of the things that we see in competitive markets and smart grid technologies uh, is that um, with all, all the technologies that I've described, you know, you can get a sense of how the system is being pushed closer and closer to stability and reliability margins, right? But some of these smart grid technologies the storage uh, deployment strategies can help mitigate some of these challenges. As I mentioned, there are some creative ideas coming out, but they will need support from regulating bodies. So um, the policies that are developed by different countries, different regulatory agencies uh, will need to keep up with these technologies and promote them and make this happen uh, quickly and expeditiously. And in the meantime, there's a tremendous thrust in the deployment of storage technologies and transmission upgrades. Um, some of the transmission up upgrades include flow control technologies. And uh, as I was telling you earlier, a combination of storage and transmission upgrades can significantly improve the penetration of renewable resources. With that, I'm done with my presentation and I'd like to thank you for your time and I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Joydeep. It was a very nice presentation and uh, we're very glad to have all this information about the uh, very recent trends in power system operation. And also we have a good audience that has multiple questions and I'm leaving the floor to Akin uh, in order to make, you know, to realize the QA session. Akin. Thank you, Ozan. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this nice presentation with real and very good examples. And we have several questions. The first one, is from Aisha. What would be the further impact of new generation high power electrical loads such as electrified transportation that has mobile characteristics on the requirement of flexibility options to mitigate variability of the difference between supply and demand? That is a loaded question because uh, it comes with both significant difficulties, you know, many technical challenges largely because of its uh, mobile nature. There is also a lot of opportunity there. Uh, and uh, you are, um, because you asked this question, I know that you are aware of the tremendous amount of research that is going on uh, in, in that field in terms of trying to utilize electric vehicles uh, to help mitigate some of these challenges. Now, th there are a few problems associated with this. I, I say problems because uh, some of these are non technical, okay, and need regulatory help. So, in very simple words, here's a question. If you paid um, a good deal of money for a new electric vehicle and you were given an incentive for uh, using this vehicle to help mitigate some of the uh, grid challenges by plugging it in and 
using the storage in it to um, help the grid. You realize that the cycling will probably reduce the life of the battery. Okay. Would you want to use your car for that? Now, the truth is that, you know, I've heard a lot of perspectives and there's a lot of debate about that. Now, th the reason I bring this up is unless we can find a good solution to this, um, a good surefire way of compensating you for the reduced lifetime of your batteries, okay, um, you're not going to be willing to do this. Once we, mm -hmm. once we, if we are able to overcome this challenge, okay, uh, uh, with a regulatory framework for compensating you, now comes the technical challenges. Some parts of the grid will allow you to do this, okay, to plug in for charging and discharging. Some parts will not, okay. Uh, you know that the deployment of charging stations has been slow and, you know, fraught with a lot of problems. Um, there's a lot of randomness. And that is the subject of a lot of research in this area. So what I'm trying to say is I don't know how, uh, what kind of time frame we are looking at in terms of uh, taking advantage of this. But one thing is for sure, the whole world is moving very rapidly in a direction where uh, the predominant transportation will be electric. And whether we are able to use them for grid support or not is a thing that is open for debate. But uh, what we know for sure is that it's, it's going to be electric. I don't know if that answers your question, but there is not a very simple answer to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And the, the other question is from Hilal about the energy storage systems. Besides energy storage option, can you please explain the implementation of demand response programs, advantages on frequency regulation in the power system? Yes. As an alternative. Yes. And I, I briefly talked about it before when I was talking about uh -huh. generation following. So generation following is an extreme case of demand response. Right, because uh, what you're doing in generation following is uh, using demand response to track the generation so that now your demand response is basically uh, flexible loads where uh, you have some curtailable loads, okay, where you are able to shift loads from uh, peak hours to off peak hours and so on, but also maybe you are using some storage to supplement it, right? So that gives you uh, control of demand response. Now, there's a lot of work going on in demand response. Um, the role of storage, for instance, not just electrical storage, but also thermal storage, because uh, uh, there's a lot of exciting work on, uh, on thermal storage uh, in, in the space of demand response, um, utilizing air conditioning systems, uh, trying to take advantage of the thermal mass of households uh, that are connected to a feeder, okay? Um, then there are, there's a lot of work on building energy systems. Um, uh, you know what I'm talking about, uh, zero energy buildings and things like that, using them as a collective resource for various grid services. So th there's a lot of research going on in this direction, and I'm hoping that some of this will be implemented in the near future. But um, demand response is only one aspect of uh, some of this exciting research that's going on. Thank you, we hope so. And the, the other question is again about the electric vehicles as they are very famous nowadays. When the electric vehicles will be common, I think people will charge that EVs at night. Uh, what do you think about the availability of wind energy with this energy demand? Well, Mohammed, I think you have answered your own question. It is true that <laughs> when there is more wind available in the night and uh, it, it is true that that will help with charging the electric vehicles in the night. 
if uh, uh, you're able to uh, beef up the distribution system accordingly because you know that uh, these charging stations will uh, increase the loads on your feeders and the transformers, distribution transformers quite a bit. And if all this is done in a coordinated, implemented in a coordinated manner, then uh, it is true that we can take advantage of the fact that wind energy is more abundant in the night. And that is when most electric vehicles will charge. Mm -hmm. And the, the other question, how can the possible direct and indirect costs caused by the variability of wind and solar energy be taken into account in the project pre uh, preparation phase of these sources, or is it possible? Uh, direct and indirect costs caused by variability of wind and solar. What do you mean by direct and indirect costs? Do you mean the installation and maintenance and operation costs or um, I think the other operational... societal costs? It seems to me also like this. It seems to me like the operational costs. Operational, uh -huh. means... Right. Now... Because, because of the, the capacity value you mentioned. Right. So there are there are many aspects here because, uh, you know, people think that because the there is no fuel involved, okay, uh, wind is free and sunlight is free, but the technology that is used to convert is not free in terms of capital cost or in terms of ongoing costs. I told you uh, in my in the example that I gave you of the wind turbine, I told you about how much is actually paid out on an annual basis to uh, maintain these, to pay rents on the land use and things like that. So uh, indeed, when wind farms or solar parks are planned, they have to take these costs into account. Another cost that they have to take into account is the decommissioning cost because uh, if you think of a wind turbine or uh, you know a large number of solar panels, okay, uh, their their lifetimes are in. How long do wind turbines last? About 25, 30 years. Solar uh, solar panels last about 20, 25 years, right? After that, you have to decommission them, uh, and there's a cost associated with that. Or if you even if you replace them, there's a cost associated with that. So uh, planning studies actually use uh, an approach called net present value, okay, where they uh, convert all this, all these future costs, okay, to today's cost, taking into uh, taking into account things like what you are, would pay out in interest and uh, what is the rate of return and things like that, and uh, that is how utilities plan their investments in these resources thank you the, the next question is from uh, I, I think we passed one question oh, yes there was a question from jihan gildor I I can read for, for, yes that's for, it that's uh -huh. in your experience which methods are the most appropriate for addressing uncertainties in renewable energy generation there, there are many statistical methods in use uh, um, depending on exactly what you're trying to do, you could be using uh, things like the auto, auto regressive moving average method and things like that for forecasting. Okay, there are many emerging methods that use uh, data sciences, machine learning, and so on. Uh, and these are the these are turning out to be uh, very effective. So there's a lot of work going on in that area. It's hard to say which will emerge as the most effective, but definitely there's not one method. Even today, there are many methods that uh, have been shown to be quite effective in addressing the uncertainties. Thank you. And a more technical question. What can you say about the wider applicability of dynamic line rating concept, especially to enhance the wind power generation and to reduce congestion issues. I think also it has a second part. I think I can. Ah, yes, it continues. And will it be economically uh -huh. beneficial? 
especially considering the existing real world examples. Okay. Uh, this is this is actually a very interesting field. I don't know how much uh, research is going on in um, Turkey in this area, but you know there was a time when dynamic line rating was considered uh, a very promising area. But unfortunately, in most of the world, they they've sort of stopped looking at this uh, seriously in recent times. However, I think there's still more in France or something like this in uh, the uh, middle of the Europe. I think there's still more. But also, I read a report in, uh, from the Department of Energy that uh, they may be planning for more in 2020s. Yes. So uh, let me share my thoughts about dynamic line rating. I think this mm -hmm. is a very promising approach. You know, if, if you can implement it correctly, and I, I think the technologies that can support this uh, concept of dynamic uh, line rating are uh, rapidly developing too. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples. You know, in, in the past, they used to have these um, stress type meters to determine how much the uh, line is being loaded and uh, how much spare capacity it has. But then they realized that, hey, um, yeah, th these were SAG tension devices, okay, and they were fairly expensive and complicated. But now they've realized that we, we can just use CCD cameras, right, <laughs> to um, observe the SAG of a line, okay. And so if you have a smart grid uh, network, uh, you know, framework that observes the SAG of different lines in real time to help determine the dynamic ratings of the lines, that is... Uh, something that can be coordinated centrally to dispatch power, okay, to uh, 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 redispatch power through lines with uh, additional margin now. And this is good because, you know, where there is wind blowing, that actually uh, uh, wind blowing over tra across transmission lines actually increases their dynamic rating, okay? And that lets you take advantage of that. So now, um, I was telling you about aggregation using transmission capabilities, uh, additional transmission. Now, if you can utilize dynamic ratings, then you can actually reduce some of the needs of uh, for additional uh, transmission if you have the right framework for this. So I really think this is a very promising and exciting concept. Uh, it's uh, moderately complex uh even at the implementation level but i i think this is very uh, this is an excellent point i think this is a very promising avenue personally i also agree with you jody really about the dynamic line rating but there's still some concepts to be developed especially for the field area because uh, there are merged concepts or there are single concepts to uh, observe what can be the real rating that the line can carry? But uh, I also agree with you that it's a promising area. Yes, and the technology has come a long way since uh, the time when they tried to implement this, but the technology was complex. Now we have simpler and more effective technology to help implement that too. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and uh, I think for the last one, uh, Alena can help us about not this one, but for the last one. Uh, from the uh, for the last two ones, there there are two from uh, Sue, it is Sue Terzi and uh, Tafur Gökçek. Alena, maybe you can help us also for, also for this. So, would it be economic to utilize energy storage systems in normal Alena, locations? Alena, we cannot hear you. Okay, would it be economic to utilize energy storage system in normal operation? time frames and emergency conditions for increasing reliability and resiliency respectively yes I, yes it, it, it is um it is possible but if it is economy uh, you know i don't know how economic it is because storage is still so expensive that um it's uh, going to be very expensive to make this happen at today's uh, prices for storage. Now, 
large storage facilities uh, using flow technologies like vanadium redox okay these if we are uh, if we can implement them correctly would uh, help with reliability and resiliency but you see a lot of uh, the storage that is being implemented these days are on small scale using lithium ion type batteries uh, and while they have some local impact on reliability and resiliency uh, on the larger grid they don't have much impact um, we are not building sufficient uh, amounts of grid scale storage that is you know megawatt megawatt hour or megawatt day scale storage um, i think the most recent large storage deployment was that of the 200 megawatt 800 megawatt hour bat uh, vanadium redox battery in dalian in china okay but there are not very many ambitious projects like that uh, again you know it's technology and cost um, if storage becomes cheaper then this is definitely a very viable and promising option there's a lot have... of research going on in uh, you know uh, developing cheaper and larger scale storage technologies that can last from days you know not just hours but days I think the main problem is the money. If we have more money, we can implement everything. Um, it's it's not just money. The question is, you know, you also have to look at the uh, the environmental impact, right? Uh, what is the state of the technology? Even if we wanted to throw that a very large amount of money at a technology, is it good? Okay, uh, good for the planet good for um the environment good for people so th there's a lot of factors that you have to look at sure it's not an easy answer but the short answer is at this time it's not very economic and uh, again we've we've done some sponsored research in this area to look at the feasibility and uh, it's still very hard to justify uh, the cost of storage when you look at the benefits, okay, at the present day rates. And the last of the last, Alina. Uh, what can you say about high scale peer to peer energy trading based support for the high capacity for storages such as pumped hydro in the case of deviation of on site? Uh, wind or solar generation? Okay, that's a very good question because it there's no easy answer to it. Okay, uh, but I, I'll try and uh, give you this uh, answer in simple terms. Okay, um, pumped hydro for the most part is not very good at this. Uh, now that sounds counterintuitive, so let me explain. A lot of existing pumped hydro facilities were not built uh, uh, to deal with variable amounts of energy. You know what I mean? So they were built, for instance, for char uh, charging in the night and discharging in the day. And that means in the night you charge at full capacity and during the day you discharge at full capacity. Okay, so when, when the wind blows and the amount of energy available is varying with time, it's uh, then you need asynchronous turbines in a pumped hydro system, and there are not very many pumped hydro systems that have asynchronous turbines. Okay, so that makes it practically difficult unless you are able to retrofit these pumped hydro uh, stations with asynchronous turbines. Um, what about other uh, technologies? Um, some of the larger uh, flow uh, battery type storage facilities that are uh, being built. For example, I'll come back to the uh, vanadium redox technology. Okay, vanadium redox is a very versatile solution. Okay, it it can uh, function across many time scales. It can supply some amount of energy quickly to uh, respond to 
um, very fast discharge needs like you know inertial or uh, frequency response. Okay, at the same time, it can also provide reliability and smoothing over large periods of time. And uh, you do that by you know uh, letting it operate in static mode for short periods of time, but when sustained amounts of energy are required, you turn on the pumps uh, within the, so it's a large battery, right? It's a flow battery facility. And once you turn on the pumps, you can supply a lot of energy over a longer period of time to deal with uh, things like smoothing and reliability. So depends on the technology. Again, pumped hydro, you know, depends on what the installation has in it. Does it have asynchronous turbines that will help? Um, so that's as simple as an answer as I could give you. But the quick answer is it depends. Okay, because uh, for peer-to-peer -peer trading, you you are operating across different time scales. So does your technology, your storage technology, support each of those time scales? That is the fundamental question in this uh, problem that you're trying to address. And Joey, right? we, have, we have a very ambitious uh, audience so that oh, the <laughs> questions do not yes, last. Yes. But uh, this is the, I think this is the last of the last. And let me ask <laughs> it to you as the last one. Uh, what is the role of renewable energy portfolio manager in the market participation? There is, again, a techno-economic uh, question. Well, I, I don't know what you expect me to say in response to this. Uh, you know, uh, this will have to be Joy, determined we love, by... We love money so that all the questions <laughs> come from money. <laughs> is there a role? Yes, absolutely, there is a role. And uh, so I'll... I'll I'm not sure I know the exact answer to this question, but I'll give you my twist on this, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I know that a lot of utilities are hesitant to fill the gap between market participation at the consumer end and at the wholesale end, okay? So there are a lot of uh, third parties that are coming in as aggregators. And I think that is what you have in mind as the renewable portfolio energy manager, okay? Because that is a very flexible space with a lot of potential and uh, it needs some amount of regulatory support today, but if that comes in, it will help um, with a lot of services that bridge transmission and distribution, okay? And you know, from going from the utility to the customer, okay, um, helping the users to become prosumers rather than just being customers. Um, it's today it's a slow process because of regulatory challenges and because of slow utility acceptance. But if regulators uh, are supportive of this, then they can accelerate the process by promoting third party entities and aggregators to fill the gap. That is my take on this. Thank you very much, Joydeep. We have been very, very honored to have you tonight. Okay, we were we made you very tired. I apologize for this, but it has been a very good DLP for us. And we, have, we had a very good, uh, the participation for in this manner. And thank you very much, Joydeep, Professor Joydeep Mitra, for such a nice presentation and for such informative answers to all of our questions. And uh, I hope that we will again host uh, Joydeep in the future in different applications and one day in person here in a physical meeting. Joydeep, please give your uh, promise to us to also be here uh, physically next time. So I'll, I'll give you some closing comments. First of all, thank you all for inviting me to, to do this. I, I myself enjoyed the presentation and uh, I, I hope uh, everybody learned something from it. I also enjoyed the Q&A session. Um, I, I, it was very nice to see that 
um, a lot of people had some very insightful questions and uh, I, I don't know to what extent I was effective in answering them, but uh, it was great. Uh, they were the, they were all very thought provoking and uh, it, you know I'm, I'm very pleased that we had such a rich audience here. Okay, and finally, I'd like to say that, you know, I wish I could have been there in person. The last time I visited Turkey was my, you know, in 2012 when I came to Istanbul. I, I really loved that visit. And, you know, uh, I'd like to come again. You know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful country, um, beautiful places. I'd really love to come again. So uh, if you want that promise, yes, as long as you're willing to invite me, I'm Always delighted to come over and <laughs> visit you folks. It will be great for us to host such a friend. And also you have some uh, good wishes from some friends like Ayusun Köksal for such a nice presentation. And he, she said also presentation and being your lecturer again has been great. And next time, let's see you in person. And thank you everyone also for participating in uh, such a great DLP and I hope to see you next time uh, in a healthy manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. We will be, we will be waiting for you at the backstage, Joydeep. Yes. I'll stick around. Yes.